Will do, thank you. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for participating in our remote meeting for the legislative uh, committee. We'll do our best to facilitate a smooth meeting with public participation. We ask that everyone be patient as we navigate this together for the first time. We have two formats for participation, the Zoom web application as well as teleconference. Before we begin, I want to review some guidelines and general instructions for the meeting. These are very important, so I ask that you pay close attention. Please silence your communication devices, such as your de cell phone or desk phone. This will ensure that we are not hearing any feedback or causing interruption during the meeting. During the meeting, all participants on Zoom, including all committee members with the exception with the exception of uh, for board members at, and the chair and certain South Coast Aid Community staff will be placed on mute by the host. That means that you will not be able to mute or unmute your lines manually. Committee members that wish to be recognized to speak will be unmuted when they click on the gray raise hand button. After each agenda item, the chair will announce public comments. For the Zoom, uh, for those on Zoom, if you would like to make a public comment on the Zoom screen, please click on the participants button on the bottom of your screen. A list of participants will appear on the right side of the screen. At the bottom of the list, please click on the gray raised hand button. This will signal to the host that you would like to provide public comment and you will be added to the list. If you are using Zoom on your smartphone and you screen will pop up with a list of participants. Look for the word uh, raised hand uh, button screen. For those using in the, the phone line, you can dial star nine on your keypad to signal that you would like to comment. Your name will be called when it is your turn to comment and the host will unmute your line automatically. Please note you can hang up and leave the Zoom meeting at any time. Please adhere to the speaker time limit Please treat others with the courtesy and, re and civility and respect the public for the public meeting process. Rules prohibiting the use of signs, posters, and signs or posters remain in effect for vote video participation. Profanity, discriminatory comments, or obscene gestures is prohibited. Disorderly, unruly, or aggressive behavior that infringes upon the rights of others or disrupts the good working order of the meeting is also prohibited. Any violation of the Above rules can result in your mic being muted, your video shut off, or you being dropped from the phone or the Zoom meeting lines. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Legislative Committee meeting on October 9th. Um, I will ask uh, for a roll to be called first. Good morning. First off, uh, Dr. Burke. Council Member Buscayano, Senator Delgado, Supervisor Perez. Here. Supervisor Rutherford. Here. Chair Mitchell. Here. Thank you very much. We'll get right into our agenda. Um, as we usually do, we will hear first from our consultants in Washington, D.C. on activities there. We have your written reports, and I will ask you to give an update on uh, those written reports. First, we will hear from Cassidy and Associates, and I believe we have Jed Dearborn uh, with us this morning. Good morning, Mr. Dearborn. Go ahead. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor Mitchell, and, and thank you all for having me here this morning. Um, I'm going to cover the energy bills that are moving in the House and the Senate because they potentially contain several key provisions for, for South Coast. In the House, the Chamber passed the Clean Economy Jobs and Innovation Act on September 24th, largely on a party line vote. The bill is a $135 billion energy research and development package that also includes several clean air provisions. Of particular interest to South Coast are three provisions. Uh, the first is the reauthorization of the Diesel Emissions Reduction Act at 500 million per year through 2025. This would represent a five-fold increase from the last authorization of 100 million per year. Uh, the second is a $1 billion per year climate smart ports program at EPA to provide grants for ports, port users, and air quality management agencies to invest in zero emissions technology for cargo handling equipment and harborcraft. The program also supports the development of shore power and clean energy microgrids at ports. And the third is the expansion of an existing transportation electrification program 
to include a $2 billion per year fund for grants to states and local governments for projects facilitating electrification of the transportation sector and projects deploying plug-in electric vehicle charging infrastructure. And so that's in the House side. That bill's passed. In the Senate, they're still working on getting floor time for their companion bill, which is called the American Energy Innovation Act. This bill is substantially similar to the House bill on the emerging technology side, but it does not include any of the clean air provisions that I just went through. Senator Murkowski is working on securing floor time, but there are a few Republican holds on the bill, and she has to work through those holds before she can get the bill to the floor. After the bill passes the Senate, uh, the Senate and the House will enter into informal conference negotiations to hopefully come up with a compromise package to enactment by the end of the year. And so we remain in constant contact with key leadership and committee staff to ensure that uh, South Coast priorities are going to be included in the final compromise package. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dearborn. Do you think that that's going to make it through this, uh, this 116th Congress? I think it has a shot. Um, one of the political elements pushing it is that Senator Murkowski will no longer be the chair of the Energy Committee beginning next Congress, and she really wants to get something done and get a compromise deal with the House. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for, um, for Cassidy and Associates on their report? From my committee members. Not seeing any. We'll move on to the next one. And we have um, Kadish and Associates, and I believe Mark Kadish is on the phone. Good morning, yes, Mark. Yes, good morning, Madam Chair. How are oh, you? Good. And good morning, everyone. Uh, two brief updates to our written report. Um, the COVID relief bill, which we're following, as I'm sure you all are following, has uh, been a negotiation for some time now between uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin and Speaker Pelosi. Um, they're you know, um, uh, over a trillion dollars apart and lots of issues. Uh, on Tuesday, I'm sure most of you noticed that the president uh, tweeted to in those negotiations, but yesterday um, uh, they were restarted. And uh, we understand that today the um, uh, White House is sending up a, a new proposal that we've not seen. So we'll be on the lookout for that. Um, uh, of note though, that uh, Senate Majority Leader McConnell uh, did give a, uh, a press release today saying that he believed that it was unlikely that the bill would pass before election, but obviously that leaves open an opportunity in the lame duck. Uh, whether that's accurate or not, uh, there have been lots of twists and turns in this COVID relief package, uh, so we'll just have to keep watching and, and keep advocating. One issue that we have been paying a particular attention to at the direction of um, AQMD staff, Derek and Lisa, is special districts. So we've been working, all of us, all the um, teams have been working to try to include language on special districts uh, in, the, in the bill, the COVID relief bill, if and when it moves. Uh, we've worked very closely with Congressman Garamendi, who is, uh, proposed, who's proposed language that we strongly support. Uh, Speaker Pelosi in the House uh, supported and passed a bill, uh, including special districts, although it's uh, permissive and not a requirement as we would like to see special districts get funding to set aside. So we'll continue to push that issue uh, uh, during this COVID relief package uh, debate. So uh, with that, we'll take any questions. Thank you. Any, any questions for, uh, for Mark Kadish? Okay, we'll just keep our fingers crossed that something happens there. Uh, and next we have a report from uh, Carmen Group, and I believe Gary Hoitzma is with us this morning. Good morning, Gary. Yeah, good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just my report, I'll just focus on a little uh, look ahead, what we're looking at here, status of uh, major things, you know, the uh, appropriations, annual appropriations that we're always following with DERA funding, targeted airshed grant funding, EPA funding. Um, Congress passed a, a continuing resolution as we expected at the end of September, pushing it back to um, December 11th. So Congress has until December 11th in the lame duck to try to decide what, what happens next. Um, the hope would be that they could conference these appropriations bills and get an omnibus package of appropriations passed as they've done in prior years. We'll be looking for that. We'll be watching developments on that very closely. And also understanding the possibility in the election year that there be incentives on all sides maybe to push this back to February or March 
give the new administration, new Congress a chance to um, attack the, uh, the old appropriations bills. That's always a possibility that we're looking at. Now, secondly, uh, part of that CR had a provision to uh, postpone or extend the uh, surface transportation bill to September 30th, 2021. That was also expected. Uh, that's, that's good news in the sense that it, it opens up the issues of highway, transit, transportation, surface transportation, as well as climate, infrastructure, all of these pieces that we're always looking at very closely because they are vehicles to, to attach a lot of AQMD uh, priorities. And so that will be front and center next year. They will have this, the September 30th deadline, whether it's a new administration or the same administration, I think it will be uh, the same incentive to get a major infrastructure transportation bill done next year. And we'll be looking closely at that. So that's my uh, report for today. Happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Well, that's good news on surface transportation. Uh, any questions for uh, Gary Hoitzma? Not seeing any, I will ask if there's any public comment on the report from the federal consultants. Pardon me, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanna notify you that Senator Delgado did just join us. So just wanna make you aware of that. Thank you. Good morning, Senator Delgado. Um, and is there any public comment on uh, agenda item number one? There's no public comment. Thank you. We'll move on to the state consultants first up uh, from California Advisors. Uh, we have uh, Ross Buckley. Could you give us an update on your written report, please? Good morning, Madam Chair and board members. Thank you for allowing me to provide a couple of updates from my written report this morning. Uh, the first, I'm happy to report that Senate Bill 895 by Senator Archuleta uh, passed the legislature at the end of August and was signed into law by the governor just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, SB 895 was supported by South Coast AQMD, uh, and the bill would allow the Energy Commission to spend money from one account on the development of zero emission fuels and infrastructure. Uh, South Coast staff was involved and engaged, uh, you know, throughout the process of this bill and uh, happy to report that it passed the legislature with, you know, overwhelming support. I don't think it received a single no vote uh, while it moved through the legislature through the, through the shortened condensed legislature. Uh, uh, the second issue I want to speak about this morning was the state budget. Uh, as you may recall, the state was facing a $54.3 billion deficit. Uh, what seemed like a lifetime ago, but was really just a few months ago uh, in June while they were crafting the, the state's budget. Uh, one of the tools to balance the budget and kind of close that gap, uh, the lawmakers and the governor used uh, were called trigger cuts. And those trigger cuts revolved around the California receiving $14 billion in federal flexible aid. If that money was not received by October 15th, 2020 of this year, uh, dramatic cuts in the billions of dollars would be made automatically. The hardest hit programs from those trigger cuts are education related deferrals, state worker compensation reduction, and our higher education systems in the UC and CSUs. Um, I think you know, it's important to say with the kind of the mixed signals from the federal government uh, over even the last 72 hours about whether a comprehensive uh, or skinny uh, stimulus package was coming out. You know, I think most folks in California assume that we're not going to see receive money by next uh, Thursday. So uh, those cuts will kind of be unavoidable, unfortunately. Uh, I feel like I've said this, you know, a number of times this year, but uh, something that we thought would be far-fetched or unrealistic in June that the California wouldn't see receive additional aid from the federal government uh, is about to happen next week, unfortunately. Uh, that concludes my uh, verbal report. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Uh, I just have I uh, want you to reiterate what, what those cuts will mean. I think you said it was primarily to education. Could you kind of just give us that list again? Yeah, so uh, the biggest is education deferrals, which 
is essentially a mechanism that allows uh, the state not to be owing the our K through 14 education system. I believe it's about five billion dollars. Uh, it allows the education system to either borrow money or use reserves. Uh, the other one is uh, employee worker compensation, state workers. So one of the biggest uh, budget issues uh, that was resolved in the June negotiations is that the governor negotiated with every state bargaining unit to come to a deal to either delay raises or take furlough days. And there was money in the tune of, I think, three to $4 billion to help offset those reductions and furloughs and to get, you know, cost of living adjustments back to state workers. So that's not going to happen. And then uh, it was close. It was about $400 million each to the UC and CSU systems that won't be funded. I see. Okay. Uh, any questions for um, uh, Ross Buckley on that report? Not good news for California. So we brace ourselves. <laughs> um, and then we will go to uh, Gonzalez and Sons. And I believe Paul Gonzalez is with us. Yes, I see Paul. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Uh, Ed, and give us your update. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just have a, a quick brief update to our written report. I wanted to provide the committee with a brief update on, the, on two of the governor's recent uh, executive orders. The first one is on his executive order for electronic CEQA filing. Back on April 23rd, the governor issued executive order N5420, which allowed for 60 days the electronic filing notification and public access requirements for projects undergoing CEQA. Once that executive order expired, our firm started working with the governor's office to address some of the current concerns that this caused the district. We had numerous conversations and emails on the issue. And on August 26th, we had a conference call between AQMD staff and the governor's office. And we discussed the, the issue at hand and, and what options the district had moving forward. Ultimately on September 23rd, um, the governor issued another executive order, which extended the original executive order on electronic CEQA filing. This time, however, due to really the hard work and the continual communication from, from your staff and the governor with the governor's office, uh, this executive order was extended indefinitely or, or until the governor modifies it or terminates it for any county whose, whose clerk's office is still closed. So. Um, if the clerk's office is closed, electronic SQL filing is, is good until the governor modifies or terminates that. And again, it, your staff was fantastic on this issue and, and the governor's office expressed to me how much they appreciate us reaching out on the issue and, and helping to educate them and how to best extend this executive order. So it was, it was a very good team effort on that issue. The other one I wanted to provide you a quick update on is the governor's executive order to require um, sales of all new passenger vehicles in California to be zero emission by 2035. Uh, CARB will develop the regulations, which will achieve more than a 35% reduction in GHG emissions and an 80% improvement in oxides of nitrogen emissions from cars statewide. Additionally, CARB is going to develop regulations to mandate that medium and heavy duty vehicles, along with drayage trucks, shall be 100% zero emission. Drayage trucks will have to be 100% by 2035 and medium and heavy duty trucks by 2045. And lastly, the executive order requires state agencies to work with the private sector to accelerate the necessary infrastructure needed to support zero emission vehicles. So uh, that is the extent of my update and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Any, any questions for Paul Gonzalez this morning? I'm not seeing any, so we will move on to our next report from Resolute, and that report will be from David Quintana. Hi, 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 Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, thank you for having me on here. Um, uh, going last is always a benefit and a curse uh, when you have such an amazing state team like we do. Um, so uh, both Ross and Paul have pretty much covered everything. So what I would just like to uh, add to the conversation is that. As we know, the legislature will be returning, um, but while most people associate that with January, I want to remind everyone uh, at AQMD that they actually, at South Coast, that they actually return on December 7th. And um, as Assemblyman Perez and uh, Senator Delgado know very well, 
not only do they return, they introduce well over 100 bills. So we will begin looking and tracking and um, examining legislation uh, as of December 7th when they return. Um, every member will get to uh, introduce at least one. Some senior members and leadership do much more than that. So anyway, that's all I wanted to add, ma'am, is just put that on everybody's radar so we're prepared um, for the influx of legislation on December 7th. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for David Quintana? I don't see any. So uh, I will ask if there's any public comment on our report from our state consultants. No public comment. Okay, thank you. We will move on. Uh, the next item is an end of year uh, summary report on state legislatures and the governor's actions during 2020. And uh, for that, we will turn to uh, Philip Crabb uh, to give us that report. Good morning, Philip. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. Yes, I will be providing a year end summary of activities in Sacramento. And this year was, of course, the second year of the 2019-20 legislative session, which reconvened on January 6th. And legislators introduced over 2,200 bills in 2020, but less than a quarter of those bills remained active during near the end of the COVID-19 shortened session. And this was a much lower number of bills than usual. And due to the shortened session and due to COVID, both houses limited the number of bills that would be heard. Ultimately, the session adjourned on August 31st and the governor had until September 30th to act on bills sent to his desk. Um, as to the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on the state legislature's schedule, as you may recall, the, the assembly and the Senate adjourned the week of March 16th and the assembly did not reconvene until May 4th and the Senate didn't reconvene until May 11th. And both houses extended their summer recesses in part due to the fact that state legislators and staff suffered from cases of COVID-19. Um, moving on to our voting district authorization bill, um, as you recall, SB 732 by Senator Allen was introduced in 2019 and became a two year bill that failed to get out of the Senate by the end of January 2020. Um, <clears throat> AB 2241 by some member Calderon was introduced in 2020 as a spot bill. The district was in negotiations with Assemblyman Calderon, who expressed interest to possibly move forward with the VDA bill, but due to the abrupt recess of the legislature in the middle of March, negotiations ceased. As to the state budget, South Coast AQMD, working with Capcoa and other air districts, was able to secure $50 million statewide from the Air Pollution Control Fund for air district implementation of the AB 617 program. However, there was no GGRF budget trailer bill because of low cap and trade auction results due to the COVID-19 recession. In the May 2020 auction, only $25 million in revenue was generated. And in August 2020, that auction generated $474 million, but that was not until near the end of session. For context, the three auctions prior to May 2020 generated $600 to $700 million each. Thus, no AB 617 incentive funding was provided from the state this year. Now, future auctions could bring higher levels of funding and potentially increase the amount of available unspent GGRF funding. Um, additionally, the legislature proposed a $100 billion stimulus package, which included some reliance on the federal government. Um, it was meant to protect Californians and spur job creation and raise money through a new tax voucher program and securitization of current revenue streams. It also included a dedicated fund for incentives to turn over dirty vehicles to cleaner vehicle fleets and for EV charging infrastructure. However, the governor and legislature could not agree on a deal and a lack of agreement on priorities and of a lack of new revenue were key obstacles. South Coast AQMD also took positions on numerous bills this year and worked hard with CAPCOA and other air districts to oppose the following four backup generator bills that were attacking air district authority. First, there was AB 2182 by Assemblymember Rubio, which exempted operation of backup generators for critical facilities during public safety power shutoff events from local, regional, or state regulation. This bill died in committee without a hearing. SB 1099 by Senator Dodd required air districts to adopt or revise rules to allow critical facilities to use backup generators during power loss and to test and maintain them without that counting towards existing time limits. It also prohibited district fees for issuance or renewal of critical facility backup generator permits. 
This bill did pass the Senate, but ultimately died in committee. SB 802 by Senator Glazer required air districts to adopt or revise rules to allow backup generator usage by health facilities during PSPSs and would allow bug testing or backup generator testing and maintenance to not count toward time limitations. This bill died in committee without a hearing, but its contents were amended into SB 1099 by Senator Dodd to make that a combination bill. And then finally, SB 1185 by Senator Morlock prohibited CARB and air districts from having rules that limited or prohibited the use of natural gas backup generators during PSPSs. It also required uh, backup generator usage to not count toward air district time limitations on usage, routine testing, and maintenance. This bill passed the Senate, but ultimately died in committee. Additionally, South Coast AKMD supported AB 2882 by Assemblymember Chu, which was sponsored by the Bay Area AKMD. The bill required charter and private schools to follow the same requirements as public schools for evaluating a school site for potential hazardous substances, emissions, or waste. It also required the evaluation of a potential charter school site to allow the same to follow the same CEQA process used for a public school. South Coast AKMD suggested an amendment to ensure that private and charter schools on lease property were also covered by the bill. The bill passed the assembly but ultimately died in committee. Then there was SB 895 uh, by Senator Archuleta, which the South Coast AKMD also supported, which required the California Energy Commission to assist and support the development of zero emission fuels, fueling infrastructure, and fuel transportation technologies. It allowed the CEC to allocate funds from the Diesel Emission Reduction Fund, or DERF, to zero emission fuel projects rather than clean diesel projects. This bill was signed into law by the governor. However, the amount in the DERF was $4.6 million um, initially, but the state budget process borrowed $4 million from the DERF, which is unlikely to be repaid, leaving $600,000 for the bill's purposes. And then finally, there was SB 662 by Senator Archuleta that was also supported by South Coast AKMD, which revised the definition of transportation electrification to include the use of renewable hydrogen as a transportation fuel in fuel cell EVs. The bill also set a progressive standard for decarbonization of hydrogen transportation fuel that mirrors the requirements for the decarbonization for electricity set by SB 100 by Senator De Leon in 2018. It also allowed gas investor owned utilities to invest in distribution infrastructure for hydrogen transportation fuel to accelerate the electrification of the transportation sector in California. This bill passed the Senate, but ultimately died in committee. Finally, the South Coast AKMD reached out to the governor twice this year, seeking action by executive order. First, we requested a suspension of Brown Act requirements to no longer require a physical location for a public meeting and to allow virtual government meetings to take place exclusively through electronic participation. The governor issued this executive order in March 2020. And as just recently discussed, South Coast requested that public notices under CEQA that are typically filed and posted at county clerk offices be allowed to be electronically filed with the state clearinghouse instead. Many county offices remained fully or partially closed to the public, so agencies are unable to meet CEQA filing and posting requirements. The governor issued this executive order in September, September 2020. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you. Very uh, extensive pre uh, presentation, Philip, uh, for what happened last year. As we can see, uh, a lot of things didn't happen. And so we'll look forward to uh, maybe getting some of our legislation passed next year. Um, are there any questions uh, from my committee members uh, for uh, Philip Crabb? I do not see any hands raised. So I will ask if there's any public comment on this report. There is no public comment. No public comment, all right. Um, we, we next have a um, report from, uh, uh, on a federal bill. Um, this is bill HR 7822, authored by Blunt Rochester. And uh, Lisa Tanaka has been following this bill. And so I'll have Lisa give a report on that. Go ahead, Lisa. 
Good morning, Chair Mitchell and committee members. Today I'm presenting on HR 7822, the Public Health Air Quality Act of 2020, um, as Mayor Mitchell indicated, introduced by Congresswoman woman Lisa Blunt Rochester with her fellow representatives, Baragon, McGeekin, Jayapal, and Rush. And there's also a Senate companion bill, which is identical, introduced by Senator Tammy Duckworth and her colleagues, Senators Durbin, Booker, Warren, Merkley, and Markey. Um, Congresswoman Blunt Rochester introduced this bill late in the session um, so that she can see seek public comment and input to create a bill that she will reintroduce in the 117th Congress. So this presents us a good opportunity to provide feedback and help her craft a solid bill. Um, the bill has five main provisions. The first is it would require the US EPA to immediately implement a one-year fence line monitoring program for specific types of facilities. Um, the second provision would require EPA to promulgate rules on fence line monitoring. The third provision would expand and repair our existing national ambient air monitoring network. And um, it would also deploy low cost air sensors. The last provision would establish 10 centers of excellence on environmental health disparities. So again, um, the intent of the bill is positive. We um, staff are excited about the opportunity to work with the Congresswoman and therefore we're rep uh, recommending a position of support with amendments so that we can go forward and work with her and also committee staff. And that is my report and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Lisa on this uh, partic particular bill? Yes, I have some. Yes, Supervisor Rutherford, go ahead, please. What sort of amendments are you thinking we would like to pursue? So um, the bill, uh, the timeline for fence line monitoring is very ambitious. So um, types of amendments like that to make the timelines more realistic for what we have actually experienced and what we've done in the South Coast. For example, our fence line monitoring with refineries, we have a lot of experience in that respect. Um, in other areas, the bill is very specific on the types of methodologies for assessing toxics. And sometimes in some cases, it's so specific that it may preclude um, local areas from choosing the best methodology. Um, as we know, air quality issues vary from even within our jurisdiction, from city to city, from county to county, it goes further state to state. So we just wanna make sure that any sort of guidance on the types of methodologies of assessing toxics and air pollutants um, are the best for each particular region and facility. Um, in other cases, it um, kind of juxtaposes federal authority and state and local authority where we do a lot of the local authority agencies like South Coast does a lot of the actual monitoring work. So we just wanna make sure that there's clear guidance and, and um, it doesn't cause any unnecessary conflicts. So those are the types of amendments that we're looking at. Um, and the Congresswoman's office has already indicated that they're, they would be very willing to accept our suggestions and are looking forward to receiving them if the board should, should give us that authority. Does anything in the existing bill um, specifically affect South Coast or are we hoping to get one of those 10 centers? Um, so it would affect South Coast in that, um, especially in the first provision, it requires the EPA to do immediate fence line monitoring at 25 of the most, um, the highest emitting toxic sources in the nation. Um, it's very specific though. Some of the facilities that could be impacted could be petroleum or chemical related, um, one three but that emit one three butyl. Dying, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, excuse me, um, benzene um, and other emissions that toxic emissions that we closely monitor here in our jurisdiction. So it's quite possible that one of the 25 facilities could be within our jurisdiction, given, you know, the size of our um, facilities that we do have and the types of facilities. Um, in addition, it's possible that we could gain um, additional monitoring sites. Um, to our ambient air network, monitoring network. And um, it is possible we could apply or a university could apply from our region for one of the centers of excellence. And so with 10 nationwide and the um, prestige of our local universities, it's you know, highly possible that we could, we could uh, effectively win one of those centers. 
Well, I appreciate those comments. Um, I, I've noted recently that the, the tenor of the board has been you know, growing annoyance at CARBs overstepping on our responsibilities and imposing so many real specific rules at the state level. And now we seem to have the federal government doing the exact same thing. Um, so I'm, I'm having trouble getting to myself to a place where I would support this. Got any other um, questions? Well, let me, let me just comment a little bit on this because um, as we look at um, the kind of air quality structure that we see in other states, um, it's much less involved than what, what has happened in California. Uh, some of the other states that we've dealt with have a very um, sparsely uh, um, populated uh, air, air management districts. I mean, they don't even have districts. They may have a, a, a central state um, uh, agency that handles air quality, but even those are fairly uh, small uh, agencies. And so I think what we're seeing here is the federal with this federal bill is a desire to uh, to find um, information from the resources that we have already developed. We have uh, even in California, we have a very well developed uh, toxics program. Uh, even other districts within California don't have the same kind of toxics program that we have here. And so this is a bill that is targeted for toxics and could be very beneficial. Uh, to other states uh, to have our input and uh, our resources uh, and our experience uh, help them develop a, an appropriate um, federal bill that addresses toxics. As you know, federal, the Federal Clean Air Act has primarily attacked ambient air quality. Uh, and this is kind of a little bit of a different direction for the federal government to go to start looking at toxics. But as we have uh, discovered here in California over the last, well, just the last couple of years with AB 617, that we need to be uh, focusing more on air toxics to get to our, to our, our local uh, cities and communities where that has been a big, uh, uh, has had a big impact on their health. So I, I, I try, I'm trying to look at it from that standpoint that um, we are very experienced and we can be of help uh, to, to uh, our legislators, our con Congress people who are trying to develop a, a program that would work across other states in the United States. So that's kind of how, how I'm looking at it. Any other comments from anybody on this? Uh, Lisa, would, do you have any comments? Uh, no, I just um, agree that a congresswoman is looking for our input, and we certainly will stress to her the importance of local agencies and the work that we do. Um, and also the, the high point is, is that the federal government may be looking to provide some funding for air toxics work, which I think South Coast would, um, would benefit from if there is funding. So Madam Chair, if I might add a little bit to the discussion, um, as you know, I'm a member of the National Association of Clean Air Agencies and uh, also the co-president or the co-chairman, excuse me, of the Criteria Pollutants Committee. And part of what you're seeing at a national level is really close examination of what California and in many ways really what we at South Coast have done with regards to AB 617. And so a lot of the work that you're seeing with regards to uh, localized community work, the rest of the nation is trying to figure out how can they address some of the community-based aspects. And so what we're seeing with regards to fence line monitoring, a lot of it is based on the mates work that we've done on our rule 1180, where we're looking at actual uh, monitoring a lot of the refineries. We're actually out front on a lot of this. And so I think the point that you, Madam Chair, and that Lisa have made is that we want to make sure that if anyone's moving in this direction, that they get the benefit of what we've done. And we want to make sure that it's effective. So that's really what we're trying to do is to make sure that we can share that experience. Uh, whether or not this bill goes, I think there's a lot of question about it. 
obviously the funding is going to be a big component. We have tremendous experience on the funding aspects, particularly when it comes to this localized community monitoring. So it's really sort of looking at how can the nation uh, look at these community scale projects and move forward. And we want to make sure that if that's the direction that uh, the federal government moves, that they really get the benefit of our experience, because we believe that we've done more of these type of projects than anybody, certainly in the state, uh, and certainly I would argue anywhere in the nation. But really just to make sure that we can provide that benefit to everybody else. Any more uh, questions or comments from, from our committee? Then I will ask if there's any public comment on this. There's no public comment. And so I think we're looking for a motion to support this with uh, uh, amendments as amendments may come up and, and our staff works with, with the uh, Congress people on this. Uh, we are anticipating certain amendments as, as Supervisor Rutherford uh, found from her question. Uh, so that would be kind of open-ended what the amendments are. And I would expect we would want uh, our staff to come back and report to us as amendments come up so that we might be having weighing in on that uh, as it happens or before it happens in case anything that we think there's anything that is gonna be detrimental to our interests. So uh, I would look for a motion to uh, support uh, uh, the staff recommendation here. I'll make the motion, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Perez. I'll second. And a second from... I, I see uh, Senator Delgado, is that a second from you? Yes. I see a nod. <laughs> okay, uh, and a, a second then from Senator Delgado. And uh, I'll call for a roll call vote on this. Senator Delgado? Yes. Supervisor Perez? Yes. Supervisor Rutherford? No. Chair Mitchell? Yes. Motion passes three to one. Thank you. Uh, then we'll go on to, is there any other business to come before the committee this morning? Seeing nothing. Um, is there any general public comment on anything that, that anyone wants to bring up this morning? No general public comment. No general public comment. That, you, that, that, that does conclude our business for today. And so we wish you all a safe and uh, successful weekend. And we will meet again uh, in, well, do I have it here? What's our next meeting? Friday, November, November 13th. So we'll adjourn to Friday, November 13th. Friday the 13th, watch out. Okay. okay. Bye all. Thank Bye. you, Madam Chair.